Welcome to our Intellectual Property and Technology Law Lecture Series. I'm Felicia Kapnigri. I'm the Program Director of the Program on IP and Technology Law, in case you haven't yet met me. Um, I have the pleasure today of introducing Kenneth B. Germain, who's Senior Counsel at Wood, Heron, and Evans LLP, who will be speaking on the unconstitutionality of overlapping trade dress and design patent protection. Mr. Germain has more than 45 years of varied experience in the trademark and unfair competition field. He focuses his practice on trademark counseling, consulting, and litigation, including early neutral evaluation. He's often been retained as an expert witness, and he's worked on uh, the US Supreme Court cases, traffics devices as a legal expert, and on Mosley versus Victoria's Secret Catalog, in which he served as an active consultant to appellate counsel. He has spoken in uh, numerous uh, educational institutions and taught. And so we are very happy also that he brought wonderful material examples and iterations of the IP at issue today. So Mr. Jermaine, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. No, you have to do better than that. Come on. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. That's it. Sound like you want to be here. Okay. I'm delighted to be here, and I want to thank everybody who's helped to bring me here. That includes Tom Berger from the Wood Heron and Evans firm. We worked together there. And, uh, of course, Felicia, who has been instrumental. So thank you. I'm also delighted that Professors McKenna and Burson, Burstein can be here. Uh, that was wonderful that she happened to be visiting here when I'm here. So uh, preliminarily, I want to dedicate this talk. I, I don't know if I've ever done this before, but... Someone very important in the IP world just died about a week ago, Don Dunner. He was the uh, one of the named partners, I think the last one alive in the Finnegan firm headquartered in Washington, a monster, but in the positive sense, IP firm there and in many other places. He was a leader, a giant in the IP bar for many, many years and a fine guy. He lived 88 years. I celebrate that. I'm sorry he's gone. And I want to tell you that uh, uh, with the help of a colleague who's now a third year student at the University of Dayton Law School, where I've taught quite a while, um, we're going to write an article on this. And uh, so this is yet another step in the preparation of that. And I want to assure you that when I show you some things today, I will not cherry pick. I'm not just going to show you the stuff that's in favor of my position. I'm going to show you everything. Although in certain areas, all of this stuff is in favor of my position. <laughs> but I didn't make it that way. It just happened to be that way. And I understand that one of you is actually going to be working for the Brinks firm in Chicago. This gentleman right here, who's what, the president of the IP association here? Very good. So I've known Jeff Handelman, for whom he's done some work there. He's the lead trademark guy there, oh, probably for decades. Jeff and I have work together on cases on occasion, and we've just known each other a long time. He's a fine guy. And I sent him uh, a number of people. I sent copies of this presentation, either this one or the Chicago debate that happened a few months ago. Uh, and uh, I asked him what he thought about it. And this is his answer. And I have his permission to tell it to you. I have it in writing, okay? okay. So he said, your upcoming program in South Bend looks terrific. Stop. That's very nice. Okay. But he didn't stop. Okay. As you know, I hold a contrary view, as does almost everybody. Congress enacted two statutes, each one having, uh, with each one having different eligibility requirements and protecting distinct interests. The two statutes are the patent statute and the trademark statute. This is harmony, not unconstitutionality. I think that is the typical viewpoint, and I propose that it is wrong. And Jeff knows I think that, and you can tell him that I held him to it. Okay. By the way, I'm not the most radical guy in the room. Professor McKenna is. <laughs> and that's because he recently, yeah, commonly known, is that what you said? He recently authored what is going to be a chapter in a book, right? And his thesis is that all of product design trade dress should be wiped out. I don't go that far, but I do think there are limits, and you will hear about them very soon. 
So uh, let's take a look at the slides. With a little luck, this thing will work. No? Hmm. You said I had a clicker. Maybe this way. No? Uh, if I don't have... Hmm. Hmm? Hmm? It doesn't seem to pick up any of those three signals. Do I have to aim it at something? No. If not, you can... Okay, now try it. Ah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start because this is largely a group of students with what I call the IP world according to KBG. That's not KGB, that's me, KBG. And uh, I mean, Putin's in the news a lot these days, but I have no connection, okay? Please be sure of that. So in the beginning, in Principio, there was the world and it was water. In the water were sharks. You don't see them, but they're there. It was a shark eat shark world. Think of the sharks as competitors. They are out to meet, to eat you, to find you and eat you, and you have to be quick, clever, fierce, whatever combination of those things to avoid it. Along came by volcanic eruption, an island with the name of P sub U, strange name for an island, of course, patent of the utility pipe. This island, of course, was derived from Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the United States Constitution, the Patent Copyright Clause, as enacted by Congress, the Patent Act, Title 35, United States Code. With certain limitations of subject matter, novelty, non-obviousness, blah, 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 you can get a utility patent. Now notice, sharks are not amphibious. That's very important, because if you're on the island, you, the sharks can't get you. You're protected. But also notice that this island has been drawn by me with a dotted exterior or periphery, dashed. The reason is it will go back into the sea, undoubtedly. And the reason for that is the constitutional command for limited times, that Congress is empowered by Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, to pass laws, which it did, to protect patents and copyrights, both under the same clause, but in different parts of US code, copyrights being Title 17, to protect authors and inventors for limited times. In the patent side, there's a certain duration. On the copyright side, another one. So if you're on the island, you're good for the time that's in the statute. Up there, another island, P sub D, patent of the design type. The same kind of rules apply, except now the term is only 14, used to be, it used to be 14, now it's 15 years, it's measured from a different place, but it's the same basic concept. The Constitution hasn't changed. The statute has changed a bit. Another one, copyright. Now, you notice I have these in Venn diagram style overlapping. The reason being that is the subject matter of these two can be the same. And theoretically, at least, you could have both of them concurrently or sequentially. There's nothing so far that says you can't. Oh, there's a fourth one, TS for trade secrets. I have it down there at the bottom, overlapping patents, because very often the same kind of stuff that's protectable through a patent is also protect, I say also, but care for, with care. You can protect it as a trade secret. If you put it out in the marketplace and it's there for more than one year, you've just lost your patent eligibility permanently, the one year bar. You can continue to keep it secret. That's fine, as long as it stays secret. You're fine. And notice that the periphery here is solid, signifying that at least theoretically, this can go on and on and on and on. Think the formula for Coca-Cola. How rich would I be if I knew it? And all the, the, all the chemists in the world haven't been able to figure it out. It's remarkable. You, the, the equator, utility versus and functionality, akin concepts dividing the northern from the southern hemisphere. All those things to the north 
are non-functional and only get protected if the, the person wanting the protection can demonstrate non-functionality. And in the Southern Hemisphere, only functionality. Ah, my field, trademark slash trade dress. Up clearly in the North, overlapping P sub D and C, subject matter wise, and therefore theoretically, you can have two or even three at the same time or sequentially, one after the other. Sequentially is usually where the problem arises. More on that very soon. So the current conundrum, curious constitutional conflict. So I've been involved in this for a long time, and I can prove it. Right there, there and there. As early as 1995, I was on record that at the PTO in Washington, D.C. area as taking this position. I did it again at a faculty colloquium at the University of Kentucky, where I was on faculty for 15 years, a long time ago. I did it in an advanced trademark seminar in New York uh, in 99. And I, and I said at that time, hey, there were maybe 100 people in the room. They were all experienced people because that was an eligibility requirement to come. I said, tell me where I'm wrong because I was espousing something that was actually antithetical to most of them. And I waited. It didn't happen. So I got more brazen. I kept going. I did it in California on a program I was, I shared the, the podium with Tom McCarthy, Professor Tom McCarthy that time in 2001. And then I did it again in New York and then hapless Halloween, isn't it close to the date right now, uh, at the University of Dayton, a faculty colloquium a few years ago. Consistent. So if anybody wants to get, is going to be blamed for this, blame me. If anybody's going to get the credit, hey, here I am. I'll take it. Okay. So here's the Constitution, the relevant portions. Article 1, Section 8, Congress shall have power, dot, dot, dot. In Clause 3, the Commerce Clause. And they're going to have to change this because it refers to Indian tribes. And I've already heard about the problem with having Columbus here in the main building on the Notre Dame campus. We're going to have to do something about this stuff. Indian tribe certainly is not PC anymore. And then 188, please never call this the intellectual property clause. It leaves out trademarks, trade secrets, publicity, dot, dot, dot. It is the patent copyright, copyright patent, either one of those clause, that's true. And notice that in it, it includes that phrase I already mentioned, four limited times. It's an absolute mandate because basically the framers of the Constitution were spooked by monopolies. And they were going to approve the concept of limited monopolies because they thought that it would incentivize innovation of these two kinds. But they wanted it to be clear that these could not be in perpetuity. So the basis for a constitutional conflict has to do with this. If it is clear that under the broadened definition of the Commerce Clause, going way back to the civil rights era, heart of Atlanta, uh, 1964 or so, where anything affecting interstate commerce became regulable by Congress, then if we didn't have a patent copyright clause, we probably could enact patent and copyright statutes pursuant to the Commerce Clause. I don't really think that's a defective line of reasoning. But what possible interaction might there be between Commerce Clause legislation, trademark law, for example, the Lanham Act, and patent copyright legislation? Today, only patents. So the copyright's similar, but no, not enough time today. So in a case I was involved in some years ago, not that long ago, the Supreme Court had to deal with a, an attempt after the expiration of the patent that protected the dual spring design you're looking at here. The question was, the same guy, the same man who had filed and prosecuted to completion the patent application that led to this patent, when the patent expired, remember, they all expire. You're always back in the water. The same guy then claimed 
In fact, I think he filed a trademark application, got a registration, claiming that the design here was non-functional, which it wasn't, of course. The design was very functional, which is why the utility patent had been issued in the first place. That he claimed it was non-functional. He got that through the PTO. He got his trademark registration, and then he tried to enforce it. That's this case. The defendant said, whoa, that thing is a, that's a functional design. The Supreme Court affirmed the permissibility of copying. Now, in first grade, Johnny don't copy is a prevailing rule. And it ought to be, because Johnny needs to learn his own stuff. He needs to learn by doing it, by taking chances, by being corrected, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's nothing else in this milieu other than Johnny's learning. But in the competitive world, we don't really care about stuff like that. We care about what's accessible to the relevant public. The more, the merrier. The more products of the same kind for the same purpose, the merrier, because what does it do? Classic theory, classic uh, price theory. It drives price down and quality up. It's called competition. Why should you buy my product rather than his? Well, mine is cheaper, mine is better, maybe both. And they do the same thing, blah, blah, blah. So the Supreme Court went on to say a utility patent is strong evidence that the features therein claimed are functional. Well, this is pretty much straightforward. The whole idea of a utility patent is to protect something that is useful and novel and non-obvious, but useful is the beginning. And if it's not useful, get out of here. You don't deserve a utility patent. Maybe a design patent, maybe something else, but not a utility patent. You already had your utility patent. When it died, game over. Don't come back and try to do something else which recharacterizes functionality to non-functionality. Why? Well, the Lanham Act, that's the Trademark Act under which this case was brought, does not exist to reward manufacturers for their innovation in creating a particular device. Lanham Act is not innovation oriented. That is the purpose of the patent law. And notice that last phrase. And its period of, of exclusivity. So right here, the Supreme Court's recognizing for limited times without citing it. The very last paragraph of this case, after a text which clearly said, you can't have trade dress protection because you already had patent protection and that patent protection was the utility kind. And the part of this that you say is now non-functional is that which you claimed was functional to get the utility patent. Case is really decided, and yet the Supreme Court dropped this last paragraph. Totally dictum, whether the patent clause, that's a short form for patent, copyright, copyright, patent, that's fine. Whether the patent clause of its own force prohibits the holder of an expired utility patent from claiming trade dress protection. Oh, in other words, is this not just a statutory decisional doctrine, or is there also a constitutional aspect to it? No resolution. Not needed. That's fine. Honestly, I'm surprised they dropped this in here at all. It wasn't necessary. But what it said to me was, ooh, the Supreme Court sees a problem, and it doesn't have to deal with it yet, but maybe tomorrow. So here are two part provisions of the, from the Patent Act, Title 35. You see the first one, 101, has to do with useful and utility patents, and the second one, 171, has to do with ornamental for design patents. Remarkably different things. So we get to these guys. And roughly 10 years ago, I was called by a, a lawyer who was litigating this case, and he said, how might you as an expert be able to help? Well, I wrote three expert reports. One was on aesthetic functionality, which Professor McCarthy, by the way, disses completely and says is oxy so oxymoronic that it doesn't exist or it shouldn't exist, a point on which I disagree with him. A second one on likelihood of confusion, you might say having looked at, felt, turned around these things, well, of course there's confusion because they're virtually identical. Did anyone notice any difference? I asked you to come up and examine. You did examine. What difference? There are some differences. What did you notice? You're not very observant. Yes, sir. The indents on the front of both of them are a little different. The indents on the fronts, you mean here and here? 
they are different. I agree with you. Are they different in any way that you think would have IP significance? I don't think so either. One happens to be a little bigger than the other. So, any other differences? Yes. The sheens are really different. Pardon me? The sheens. One's a little shinier than the other. Ah, uh, okay. If one is a little shinier than the other. Okay. Uh, all right. I'll buy that. They're almost identical. And there's, there is another difference that is pretty obvious. Not so obvious, huh? They're branded different. So this one on the top says uh, Bobrick, which is the manufacturer. It's the Bobrick Contura. And that one says ASI, which is American Specialty Stick or something like that. He also manufactured. So here's the story that goes with this. Uh, they're, they're direct competitors. They are at each other's necks. Riders. This guy came out. Not just this one, this is happened to be one particular product. There's a series of like 15 different bathroom accessory products, towel dispensers, toilet paper dispensers, blah, blah, blah. Like 15, all went to my colleague, not me, but this kind of guy, and got design patents. Okay? He is a registered patent boy. I am not. So I did my weakness this way. Okay? I've never been a chemistry. I got A's, but that was it, one year now. Into <laughs> okay. So they got like 15 of these. Now, in those days, design patents lasted 14 years from the date of issue. Now it's 15. So, I know the so what happened after 14 years? They all died. Which means, according to the normal course, they are subject to copying. If you want to call it appropriation, go ahead, but it's not misappropriation, or at least I don't think so. Along came this guy, designed to compete directly, to fit into the same places, in the same walls, with the same hooks, or whatever you're going to, you're going to call it, but sold in different boxes, identifying different colors and kind of thing. Manufacturer, and furthermore, who do you think bought this thing? When you think about likelihood of confusion, you have to be concerned. One factor in the analysis is who is going to be exposed to the two brands, and who is likely to might be likely to be confused. Who, who buys this? Woman with a Notre Dame sweatshirt. Would you go into a store and buy one? No. Why not? Um, because I am not. Bathroom builder. Yeah, very good. You're not a bathroom builder. You're not, not an instructor. <laughs> okay. and, and as a result, the, the other side of that is who does buy these is somebody who is in the bathroom industry, who is supplying probably thousands of them at the same time, who is outfitting JW Marriott or whatever. And by the way, this the distinctive feature of this. What made this sell at a higher price than other devices, the same size, the same basic shape, the same capacity, was this. Oh my God. Isn't it gorgeous? <laughs> this is, they call it Contura, and they call this the convex arc. Because all the ones before this were flat. How boring is flat? And how gorgeous is contour? <laughs> because of that difference, they were able to get the design patents. That was the, the, the innovative feature. And they were able to charge more than their other flat front products. Look, I'm not a marketing guy. You probably have one here. Some of them have maybe the back marketing consultant. Is that what you are? No, different kind of consultant. Okay. But the market judged it valuable. So they sold a zillion of these. Patents died. What happened then? Arch rival. Why don't I get into business? I've been watching this go on for 14 years. I have been stymied by the patent law. Now's my chance, which is what the patent law is designed to do. Now's my chance, come on. Because all of you and all those buyers and all those JW Marriott's want to have this kind of thing 
for less than this guy is going to charge. The public benefit is obvious. Let them compete. Let them drive drop the price, maybe make it out of better metal, so say my stuff is better, it will last longer, whatever. All these kinds of things. So that's the lawsuit. Because these are all gone, the design patent's finished. What about product design trade dress? Well, let's go through a few slides here. So there we have, that's a different feat. Again, another design patent. Here's one of the design patents. That's the, actually the one on this device. And here's another one on a different shape. But again, the, main, the, the linking feature is the convex arc. And there's a trademark registration on the same thing, the convex arc. Oh, well and good, maybe. So is it okay to do this? Remember those circles were overlapping three of them? This is two of them, not the copyright one, the other two. Is it okay to do this? Well, most guys, including Jeff Handelman, and certainly most patent lawyers, but not necessarily my colleague Tom Berger, who sees very clearly, most say the more the merrier. If you can meet the requirements of this kind of IP, go get it. If you can also meet the requirements of this kind of IP, go get it. And if they overlap, who cares? The traffic's case, not to, it, it, it's off the mark because it had to do with utility patents and then a switch from utility to non-functional. Here, they're both non-functional. The design patent and the trademark slash trade dress. So if you go back to 1879, a long time, you find the Supreme Court saying, and this is quoting from one of the leading case, case books, any attempt to identify the essential characteristics of a trademark with inventions and discoveries in the arts and sciences over the writings of authors will show that the effort is surrounded with insurmountable difficulties. In other words, trademarks are really a different bird from patents and copyrights. They rec recognized that in 1879. All right, that's a long time ago, who cares anymore, right? So in 1945, we had the Scott Paper case the court's discussion of the issue not only identified the public's right to use the subject matter of an expired patent, but also that's the deal. When Tom has a client, the client says, I want to protect this, can we do it? Tom, said, Tom analyzes it, he may do the search to see what's available, all that kind of stuff. And then and it doesn't need the novelty and non-obvious requirements, all that kind of stuff. And they're probably going to say, yes, I can do this, I can protect it. But at some point, he's going to say, by the way, patents last number of years. It used to be 17 years, now it's what, 20 from the filing of the application that leads to the patent. You're going to have to tell the client that because after that, you're on your own, you're back in the water. Remember, the water is full of sharks. They're out to get you. Here's a shark. <laughs> so clients need to, to know that. They need to plan. Now, the truth of the matter is a lot of the time, who cares? 20 years is so long in the modern situation. So many things are only innovative and still marketable for a couple of years. So maybe it doesn't matter a lot of the time, but sometimes it does. Okay. Hence, we have held that the patentee, this is still from Scott Paper, Supreme Court 45, may not exclude the public from participating in that goodwill or secure to any extent I did add the emphasis, but the Supreme Court wrote the words. A continuation of this monopoly by resorting, his monopoly, by resorting to the trademark law. In other words, hands off. You got your patent, God be with you. But God's only going to be with you in those days for 17 years. After that, God abandons you. Too bad. Sorry, it's a religious institution. But, <laughs> but and sometimes you don't deserve anything more than that. Okay? Uh, so if we continue, we see Graham versus John Deere, a leading patent case from 1966, referring to the patent copyright clause. The clause is both a grant of power and a limitation. That was going to be critical. The qualified authority, unlike the power often exercised in the 16th and 17th centuries by the English crown, and we were rejecting that, is limited to the promotion of advances in the useful arts. Advances, we want to incentivize. We want Tom's client to be told, 
in some number of years, this protection is going to go away. Go do something better. I'll get you another pact. It can be based on this one, or it can be a new one, but go back and keep inventing. And why do we care about this? Because the patent system then makes public at the date the patent is issued, and these days often earlier than that, what the innovation is. It says to the public, you may not be able to do this, but you can learn from it now. And you can also modify it and stuff like that. There's all sorts of possibilities. The frontier of knowledge is moving forward. And you now know where it is in this art. Art's a funny patent word for science. Okay? Mm -hmm. I didn't make that up either. Okay, so nevertheless, lawyers like Jeff Handelman, and believe me, he's just one of many, take the traditional view as have the courts for years. So here we go, Mogan David, 1964, CCPA, that's the old, before the Federal Circuit was blended into there in 72, I think it was, whatever, close to that. You have a couple of cases from there. Then you have a Sixth Circuit case, Kohler versus Moen, the second here, the second, the second paragraph from the Seventh Circuit, your circuit, by the way, agreed with this, but you'll see with a significant kind of footnote. Here's more. It just keeps going. Basically, these are all holding. You want more than one kind of protection up in the Northern Hemisphere where they have the three overlapping circles? That's fine. Just prove that each one of them, one at a time, fits you, your case, and you can have it according to its terms. It all sounds great, and for IP lawyers, it's a good thing because a big thrust of IP practice, Professor Burstein and I were talking about this just before, is find that which you can protect on behalf of your client and go get protection. It's the mainstay of most practice, prep and pros, preparation and prosecution of patent applications and trademark applications. Go get the protection. It's very positive, very protection oriented. Yes, of course, sometimes we have to attack them, but that's, that's a minor part of the practice, really. So who wants to tear down all of these protections? Some crazy academic. I mean, it's, you know, it's not the first time I've been swimming against the stream. Okay, and after Walmart 2000, Traffic 2001, Daystar 2003, I think it was, modern Supreme Court stuff, still the same thing. But this, remember I told you the, this one case, Kohler versus Moen, was a two to one split. And the one was this Judge Cudahy who wrote, I thought, extremely insightfully. To forbid copying would interfere with the federal policy found in Article 188 of the Constitution and in the implementing federal statutes, that would be patent and copyright, of allowing free access to copy whatever the federal patent and copyright laws leave in the public domain. But if the design is not entitled to a design patent or other federal statutory protection, then it can be copied at will, which he pulled out of the 1964, either Sears or I think it was the Comco case. They were companion cases. So he's saying, this is not right. You, you shouldn't be able to double dip. And he continued that with that approach. If the issue before us is a conflict between a, and this is very critical now for the analysis. If the conflict is between a well-defined statutory scheme the design patent laws, it's only a couple of sections in the patent law, but it's part of the entire patent law and embraces the patent law. You still have to have non-obviousness, novelty, but ornamentality rather than usefulness. If that enacted under a specific and, and limited constitutional directive, the patent clause, fairly ac uh, characterized, I believe, and the judicial doctrine, protection of product configurations as trademarks, this is what Professor McKenna is, McKenna is very upset about, very critical of, let's put it that way, only remotely incident to a generally statu general statutory scheme. The general statutory scheme is the Commerce Clause. I've referred to it many times as the Garbage Clause. It, if you can't find anything else, go reach into the garbage and see if you can find something there because theoretically, almost anything can be there because it doesn't have any particular bounds. It's just affecting interstate commerce or commerce with the Indian tribes or foreign nations. So that's pretty broad. 
the specific constitutionally mandated provisions should control. This was 1993, way ahead of his time, even before I started complaining about this, but I think this was part of the reason that I did. Because for many years, I've done an annual review. I've done a lot of lectures, but one thing that's been consistent for over 30 years is an annual review of trademark trade dress cases. And this would have been one of the ones that I came, that I came across. I, used, I always do appellate cases. And I would have, when I read this, I said, whoa, this guy's got his head screwed on right. Where are all those other losers? But the other losers over, overwhelmed this guy. He lost this case and virtually all the other cases. So what do we have now? There's a Sixth Circuit case. This is the one that I think you provided an amicus brief for, and it came out right. Thank you. And uh, that I skipped that one. Go to Apple. We we'll skipped that one. I don't think it's too much. Go to a six, another Sixth Circuit case just four years ago, Kehoe, and look at the red here. Protection against imitation and mimicry ordinarily is found in patent and copyright law. You know what the word copyright is? The right to copy. It's that obvious. It's all about copying. The Lanham Act, which unlike the patent and copyright regimes, creates exclusive rights that have no automatic expiration. Remember the solid line? Does not create a species of perpetual patent and copyright. Uh-uh. Nor does it create a cause of action for, in effect, plagiarism. The use of otherwise unprotected works, dot, 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 without attribution. The Daystar case in 2003. And here's a Seventh Circuit case, Arlington. That's your circuit, remember? The circuit from which the uh, Kohler versus Moen case came. This feature of trademark law presents both an opportunity for producers and a potential threat to consumers. Potential threat to consumers? Because if there's only one company selling something, you have to pay the price of that company if you want that thing. If there are two or hopefully more than two, then there's price and quality competition, and that is good for you and good for me when we are in the posture of buyers. Ooh. Think of what's happening in the pharmaceutical industry now, where we have some drugs that are special and patent protected, and they may be life necessary. And then we have this stuff, can you buy out your competitors from, buy them off from attacking your patent or from just copying after expiration of the patent? Who who's hurting there? We are, because we don't have access to that drug or we don't have access at a reasonable price. Let competition prevail. And this, from the Seventh Circuit again, before, because trademark protection for a trade dress has no time limit, giving one competitor a perpetual and exclusive right to a useful product feature would result in a perpetual competitive advantage. The Lanham Act does not exist, dot, 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 quoting another case. Hey, there's something wrong with this. The Trademark Act shouldn't be doing this. You want to get protection of this sort? Go see Tom. Get a patent. Go see another person. Get a copyright. That's fine. The copyrights last forever these days. Almost, not quite, but life of the author plus 70 years. Someday, someday Mickey Mouse is going to die. <laughs> it's going to happen someday, at least the early versions of Mickey Mouse, but not yet. All right, there's another Sixth Circuit case. Uh, so what about scholars? Don't ignore scholars, okay? And here's where I have to say, again, remind you, I did not cherry pick. I asked my research assistants, find everything possible that relates to this subject and show me what it is, good, bad, or indifferent. Everything we found is in favor of my position. No cherry picking. So here's one. So this is from David Welkowitz, admittedly a, a trademark kind of guy. He wrote a book on trademark dilution. Extending trade dress protection to the subject matter of an expired design patent effectively provides the practical equivalent of patent protection for the subject matter of the expired design patent. And a closer examination reveals a true similarity in the actual operation of these two sets of laws. This inverts, invites further suspicion that trademark has improperly intruded, intruded improperly into patent law. Now, when I did this debate with uh, uh, Rich Stockton in Chicago, he's a, a patent guy from the Banner Wilcock, uh, Will, 
Yeah, real hot. Thank you. And uh, fine guy, bright guy. One of the things he seized upon was, hey, they're really different. I don't think so. And this guy didn't think so. So this is, a, this is just a trademark guy, though. We don't want to take put too much stock in this. So here's Perry Sedman, a mature patent guy who makes his living from design patents. And look at the title of this thing. Can very cute, isn't it? Q with a K. Uh, can traffic cops catch the caravan copycats? He's criticizing a particular case. But look at what he says. The court should reaffirm the doctrines of Singer, Kellogg, and Sears Copco. I didn't tell you about them. Singer goes back to 1896, Kellogg 1938, Sears Copco 1964, all of which basically say when a patent fin ends, when it expires, it's over, game over, no extensions. By the way, in copyright, you, you used to have an extension term. You don't have any more. You have it for, since 1976, 78, actually. When it's over, it's over. And there's a patent guy saying this. He must be crazy. Well, maybe, maybe not. Perzanowski is now on the, I don't know where he was at 2008, but he's now on the Case Western Reserve Law Faculty, pretty good solid law school. Look what he wrote. Congress, that's my 40 minute warning, okay. Uh, Congress may not circumvent the limits imposed by one provision of the Constitution. It should be, that's some mistakes there, Constitution simply by acting under another grant of authority. You can't just say, I don't like this, so I'm going to go around it. and run. And end run's fine in football, but it's not so fine in this. Here's Perzanowski again. The commerce power is free to regulate activities. He's saying that the affect in affecting interstate commerce is a good ground, it's a sufficient ground for patent and trade and copyright legislation, but you can't use it to cancel out something elsewhere. That's the crux of this. Hence, in order to avoid rendering the patent clause superfluous, the limitations of the patent clause must apply to all exercises of the commerce clause. And by the way, it, not in these materials, but you should know that there is a Supreme Court case, not in the IP field, but in the labor field, railway labor, 1982 Supreme Court case, in which the bankruptcy clause, which has a particular limitation that bankruptcy proceedings have to be uniform through the nation, that came into conflict with the Commerce Clause. And the answer the Supreme Court gave was Commerce Clause cannot do this. The bankruptcy clause's limitations have to be preserved. If we did otherwise, we would render the limitation in the bankruptcy clause superfluous, i.e. void, useless. That's bad and unacceptable constitutional interpretation. No can do. All right, Adkins, we're going to skip. Kalkwarf was my student in the master's program at the Dayton Law School. He was a mature lawyer at the time. He was way ahead of, I mean, he's, you know, he, he'd been out of law school and been a clerk for a federal judge for a, a career clerk for like 30 years. So he really was very mature. And he took the same position that I took, but he wrote it this way. The patent copyright clause serves as a security wall, a force field, as it were, to prohibit the commerce clause from encroaching upon the limiting requirements applicable specifically to patents and copyrights. And then he says in this passage, basically, and, and the next one too, uh, hey, let's do this one. An analysis of, the, analysis of the laws involving design patents and trademarks establish that the holder of a design must be an adult, a little pejorative, and make a choice. The owner cannot have both a patent, a design patent and a trademark for the same design. The one thing the owner may never have is both a design patent and a trademark for the same design. Now, the way I resolve it is very consistent with this, but I call it the Kiwani Compromise. Kiwani. Kiwani Oil was a 1974 Supreme Court decision, came out of Ohio, I believe, and it had to do with whether trade secret law was in fact preempted by patent law. So the invention involved, it was uh, some way of making crystals, something like that, and, and the ones who came up with this chose to keep it as a trade secret rather than to go to the patent office and try to get a patent 
And I guess the theory was it's going to be hard to duplicate this. And if we go to the patent office, we're going to have to tell everybody what it is in effect. And we're only going to have a limited time. So let's, let's do it this way. So the challenge, then somebody knocked it off, of course. The challenge, or stolen, I guess. The challenge was, if you can't, this question, if you could at least potentially get a utility patent, but you chose not to, did you do something that did you, were you rejecting the federal route that you were supposed to take? If so, trade secret law would have been annihilated. Ooh. The Supreme Court ruled in that case that although you had a choice, you could freely choose. If you wanted to choose a patent, God be with you. But remember, God was only going to be with you for 17 years from the issue date. That was it. Abandonment after that. If, on the other hand, you wanted a trade secret protection, that's fine. Don't tell anybody. Don't let your employees squeal. Hope that you won't have it reverse engineered or independently created, both of which are perfectly legal. And who knows, maybe it'll last a long time, maybe more than 17 years. Supreme Court said, it's okay, we're not going to trash trade secret law. I call it the Kiwani Compromise because, I mean, look, not everybody thought this was good jurisprudence. I mean, I have to be honest with you. A lot of, you know, one of the reasons the Supreme Court gave was it's impractical. If we, if we find the other way, we're going to destroy all of trade secret law, which has been a big deal for a long time, and which, by the way, Congress has known about for a long time and has never complained about it. So my answer here is my version, Ken's Kiwani Compromise, if you will, pick one. I don't care which one you pick. You want to get a design patent, go to Tom. He'll do it for you. You want to get trademark slash trade dress, come to me. Truth is, I don't do this anymore, but my colleagues do. Ask me, and I'll get you connected to a good colleague whose rate's lower than mine, blah, 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 who does it more frequently than I do and therefore is going to do it better anyway. And, but one or the other. Doing both causes the problem that I've been talking about. This one, you chose design patent. Fine. Fine for 14 years. The deal you made with the government and therefore the public was monopoly protection, good, really good protection for 14 years, after which, go to it. Get your startup going, start making that. The fact that it fits the same places, that it looks the same, that you could finish it in the same kind of metal, all of those things, irrelevant. Competition prevails. So when I did this in Chicago a few months ago, one of the people in the audience was Tracy Durkin, who is a well-known uh, design, design patent-oriented patent lawyer from the DC, from the high-quality DC firm. And uh, she was there in the audience, and, uh, and, and I had read this piece, this CLE thing that she had done a couple of years earlier, and I think it's very salient. She goes through some of this stuff, but here's her conclusion. We may still have to wait for the Supreme Court to address the issue in order to know definitely if design patent and trade dress protection can peacefully coexist and extend one beyond the other. I agree, and Perry Sedman agrees too, although he and I both believe that the Supreme Court will come out our way. And in the final paragraph, she added this, what I, I think is very salient statement. Until the Supreme Court speaks, Intellectual property law practitioners, so that's both Tom and me, should consider both design patents and trade dress protection for the unique non-functional aspects of our client's product configuration and packaging. In other words, until the law changes, do it both ways. It's good for us because we have more things to do, more bills to charge. All right, that's the truth of the matter. And at least in the short run, It'll be good for our clients to have two modes of protection and a footnote. If we don't do both, there is this little possibility that the big M will work. The big M, malpractice. 
what you didn't do both when you could have done both and therefore when one of mine didn't work i was finished your fault so the smart practice i believe is taking tracy's advice which is do them both with full explanation okay we can do them both right now under the current state of the law throughout the nation but there is reason, Jermaine and other crazies, who think that this is not going to hold up and at one point in time, it'll come crashing down. In the meantime, do them both. You have to pay for both of them, and we'll do everything we can to get them both, but we can't guarantee they'll both go down. Let me tell you how this case came out. I never got to testify. If ever in my career as an expert witness I was disappointed, this was it because I was so itching to get on the stand about this one and explain to the judge slash jury what I just told, told you. When I tried this case out on colleagues at Wood Heron and Evans, and I remember doing this some years ago, I said, is there anything functional about this? Because the lawyer I was working with, defense counsel, said, I can convince the judge that it's functional and therefore it doesn't, doesn't get protection under trademark slash trade dress because that requires non-functional. And I said, come on. And I said to the engineers in the group, what's functional about this? I mean, because it's curved, remember that's the only the distinctive feature, this little curve. Because of that, is it stronger? No, they said. Does it last longer? No. Does it pack better? Heck no, it's more than a square box anyway. What is it about that's functional? We tried various things, none. So I said to this lawyer, that's not gonna work. We're gonna have to go through aesthetic functionality and or unconstitutionality as a last ditch effort. And he said, I know this judge, I'm gonna convince him it's functional. And he did. He got summary judgment for defendant on the basis that this was a functional design and therefore, presumably should never have been design patent protected, it should have been utility patent protected. But in any way, in any case, case thrown out. Never heard of juridical risk, i.e. you could lose. You can always lose. And not necessarily because of what you think is gonna cause you to lose. You do the best you can to advise your client of the risks, the costs, Client makes a decision, go, no go. You do the best you can. You keep good records. So you told the client such and such, here it is. Don't come back years later and say malpractice because you didn't tell me that. Ah, I did tell you that, here it is. Questions? Yes. Uh, and this, you might tell me to maybe read one of Professor McKenna's articles in response, but um, so your point is that either clients or their attorneys should pick one, either design patents, trademarks, one area of IP in order to register whatever it is their client is trying to protect. It seems to me that if you're trying to choose between design patents and trademarks, I, 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 mean, I haven't had too much experience learning about design patents, but what, since they're only limited, in time, what would be the benefit of telling a client to get a design patent over a trademark law if you're forced to choose one? A design patent is examined at the patent office, so it meets the criteria for patentability. It's new and unobvious, and it's presumed valid in the court. So it comes with a statutory presumption of validity, which can be meaningful to the judge or jury in the court. So, and, and you may lose on, on trade dress, you never know all your eggs in one basket and then if you just rely on the trade dress you you may not get it you may not be able to show that it's distinctive that it, that it deserves trade but you can register the trademark as a, as a trade dress as it was done here and that means and you do get a presumption of validity then also but you have to first use it in the marketplace and acquire your secondary meaning or you don't, you don't get the registration at all. So you're gonna to have to use it effectively, probably with a lot of advertising and marketing expenses for probably a couple of years 
before it's eligible for registration. So there's that downtime. Whereas the design patent, how long does it take to get one? Anywhere from six months to 18 months, depends on how busy they are at that particular time. But the other aspect of it is while you're selling it, trying to get the customer to get the acquired distinctiveness, if you don't file your design patent soon enough, it, it's no longer novel. So it's out there longer than a year. It's, it's, uh, so there's but you a can time limit on when you can file the design patent. And then after that, you're game over. You, you can't, that option is gone. Now you only have trade dress. So you're banking on the idea that you can prove eventually that that particular design is inherently distinctive. How many things that you sell are you going to be able to convince the trademark office that they're all inherently distinctive? Right? Well, so that's what I mean, I'm inherently distinctive. Well, I think that's right. Acquired distinctiveness. Yeah. Acquired distinctiveness. <laughs> hey, each one has its pros and cons, and there are cost differences. Design patents are relatively inexpensive, aren't they? I mean, compared to utility. General rule, compared to utility. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it depends in part on what your client wants. Is your client going to be satisfied with what's now 15 years of protection? If 15 years is, is enough or more than enough, design patent makes very good sense. Uh, can your client wait, wait a few years to get the, the powerful protection of the federal registration, which also can lead to an opposition, therefore hang, extending the time and, and the question of whether you would get the registration? There is common law protection, and there's protection under Section 43A of the Lanham Act, which is federalized, but it doesn't have any presumptions of validity. So, that's what I mean. Tra I, I think Tracy Durkin is right on for the both. And even though I think judicially that's wrong, practically, I think it's right. Are there differences in damages um, uh, you can receive for the non patents versus trademarks? It's a good question. You know. You yes, sir. No. Uh, yes, there are. <laughs> and that's one of the big ones. That's one reason why people like design patents. We've got the special statutory images um, provision where you get total profits. Uh, we don't know the test right now, but right now you can threaten the total profits for the whole product. You can just like a little hole, you could get a whole machine. Um, the other big one people talk about is uh, functionality, right? Since there's basically no functionality bar in design patents, you take something like that, you might be able to convince a judge that it's functional for trademark, nothing's functional for design patent. With only a tiny bit of hyperbole in a way there. Minimal or nothing's invalid as a design patent. Get anyway. So, I mean, again, an answer to Jeff Hamlin. These two statutory schemes weren't conceived at the same time. They weren't, I don't think they were compared to each other. I mean, patent copyright thing goes back to the Constitution and the, and the first patent act was what, 1796 or something? A long time ago. It was shortly after the, what was it in the 1790s? Yeah, okay, so it goes way back. The, the early trademark laws, statutes were ineffective. The patent. The trademark cases threw one out because it was based on the patent copyright law and actually missed it. The Lanham Act only came in in 46 and 47, and honestly, nobody was thinking about the rest of this stuff. The Lanham Act, they were thinking about words, names, two dimensional symbols, and stuff like that. Product design trade dress was black, and to the extent it existed at all, it was under state law. And then the Supreme Court in 1964 and the Sears Copco duo came along and said, State law cannot interfere with federal law. It was the supremacy clause that did that in. End of game. That, that happened here in Chicago by the Sixth Seventh Circuit. And so the idea that these two statutory schemes were somehow harmonized, I think, is fiction. Uh, and you can tell him to. Right? By actually, the way, I happen to love Jeff Hammond, but, but he happened to be the poor guy who came forward and took that position. And gave me permission to say it. I think it's actually even stronger than that. I think the, the, the very specific reason why we got a design patent statute was like very clear understanding that neither unfair competition nor copyright reached product design. And okay. it was understood to be a gap. And what year was that? 1842. 1842. So it was very early. Yeah. yeah. But it was expressly because, because everyone thought. You couldn't use the other systems. That but there was 18 anything. There wasn't any concept of product design trade dress. There was unfair competition protection, but it was much weaker, and it gave you basically remedies that were about labels. It, it was 
few and far between, and state law only, and they, and, and the Lanham Act didn't address it. Um, so, more questions, more comments. Yes, lady in the back row. So we've been talking about um, design patents and trade dress, but copyright was on the same island in your Good. little thing. How how does that? Happen? I think it works the same way. Uh, the uh, I, I have, because I have direct experience with this combination, I'm much more attuned to it. And frequently, and this is the one that comes up a lot, because the patent term is fairly short. And when the patent dies, the same folks, I'm telling you, the guy who went to the, who went to the patent and trademark office and said, this is non-functional, when he got the patent for the traffic's design, the two, then later on came to the same, came to the courts and said, this is functional. I've said, obviously, functional and then non-functional. It's the same, the same lawyer. Now, on the copyright side, it's pretty much the same problem. Copyrights have to be non-functional. The definition there is pretty similar to non-functional on the other side. I, but, but the term is so long that I know that some copyright people are very skittish about that. You mean you're taking away life plus 70? It, it seems, I don't think that's an excuse. I think it's, the problem is the same. The derivation of those two statutes, patent and copyright, very same clause. It says for limited times, both times. Congress has defined limited times differently. Okay, that was allowed. But I think it's the same problem. Do you agree? I was actually getting, I got an interesting question about that, about sequential design patent and copyright. Yeah. If there was the same constitutional issue, I had the same reaction. It seems like it's pretty limited times, but it's been difficult to Sequential as opposed to the concurrent. Well, either way, it's bad since copyrights forever. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here, copyrights forever. I mean, it, it was life plus 50, then it became life plus 70. And I thought the Eldred case so between the lines, the Supreme Court was saying, don't you come back. But you don't think so? I don't think so. Don't think so. so, so life as long as the earth goes okay. longer, we're fine. <laughs> it's like as long as they write it as one day less than eternity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what are you know, the utility patents of 20 years of filing now? You said 17 years. When, when the law changed to go to 20 years of filing, the gap in 95, 96, time window, they did studies to see are our patent owners going to lose because utility patents, you have to pay maintenance fees at 4, 8, 12, and they gradually escalate. So it better really be an important patent to be still filing. This paying this tax to the patent office at 12 years, and more than 50% of utility patents for mechanical devices, the owner didn't pay maintenance fee at that point. So it, it sort of confirmed what Kevin said. It's not very well. Ken said that science marches on. Most of these products are not still in the market 10 years now. So when you're when you're looking at this issue with the client and you're saying, Am I going to be worried about this trade dress right 20 years from now, 25 years from now? That's not the immediate concern. I mean, so I think I think of the image of Coke bottle because that is a trade dress that we all visualize, and that is presumably protected forever. Now, whether they thought that when they when they created it, I don't know. But originally subject to a design pattern. Yeah. Okay. So, but that's that's not most clients aren't thinking I'm, I'm Coke. I'm going to be around. They're thinking. Ten years is about the window. Looking, there's practicality aspect. More questions? Well, thanks very much for attending, paying attention, and uh, really appreciate it. I've had a wonderful time here for 24 hours or so, uh, and beautiful campus. And uh, good luck to everyone. Thanks.